This is the best of the week on Relevant Radio. Hi, this is Kale Clark. Welcome back to our new series on Relevant Radio's The Faith Explained, and it's called Saints in Sin City. I live as a saint in the middle of the world. That's what St. Paul was trying to tell the Corinthians to do. Open up your Bible or your Bible app now to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. And it says this, God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything even the depths of God. For what person knows a man's thoughts except the spirit of the man which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the Spirit. So really what's going on here is St. Paul is making a very, very clear point. The reason why we can know this hidden wisdom about God, this wisdom of Christ on the cross and what it means for us, we know this through God's Spirit. This is it. He's talking about the Spirit of God coming into the hearts of believers, really into the minds of believers as well. And God's Spirit tells us, resonates with the reality of the truth of the cross. This is how we can be confirmed in our hearts about it. And so as St. Paul gives us this analogy here, just as no one knows the thoughts of a person except the person himself or herself, also, only God can tell us the truth about himself. As C.K. Barrett, a biblical commentator, once said, that's really important. Now, the only reason you know my thoughts is if I tell you what I'm thinking. My thoughts on 1 Corinthians, my thoughts on anything else. It's the same with you. I'm not a mind reader. You're probably not either. So we depend on language to communicate. It's the same with God. There are certain things that we could figure out about God just from natural revelation. And St. Paul talks about this at the beginning of his letter to the Romans that God is powerful, that he's a creator. We can tell this from nature. He's a God of order, a God of beauty. But if we want specific revelation from God, what he thinks about certain things, he's going to have to tell us. And this is exactly what he did. He gave us of his spirit to help communicate his truth. So this is why Paul says in verse 13, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the Spirit. Basically, what Paul is saying is, if you were really spiritually mature, you would understand that this message of Christ crucified comes from the Spirit of God. Back in verse 10, as St. Paul said, the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, or that could be translated as the deep things of God. That's important to know as well. And scholar Richard Hayes says this, and I quote, Paul's point is that the truth about God is revealed not through philosophy, but through prophecy, not through rhetoric, but by revelation, end of quote. I really like how he put that. God's truth is not revealed through philosophy, although philosophy can help us understand God, to be sure, but it's revealed through prophecy. It's not revealed through rhetoric, slick teaching but by revelation. And so this is what it's about. And so these deep things of God, it's not secret knowledge that you can only get, you can only acquire if you hang out with certain people, join this certain little club. No, this is public. God made it known to all people in the world through the public death of Christ on the cross. And the Catholic faith is also public. It's an open secret. It's open knowledge. It's not secret at all. And there's so many cults uh, in the early years of the church that, that claim to have the secret knowledge, the inside scoop about what Jesus was really all about. That is a total contrast to the public faith of the Catholic Church, which is accessible to anyone. This is what the creeds are all about. We tell you what we believe. Here's what St. Paul writes in verse 14, 15, and 16. He says, The unspiritual man 
does not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, when he says the unspiritual person doesn't receive the gifts of the Spirit of God, he's not talking about spiritual gifts that the Spirit gives to us that we're going to hear Paul talking about later on in the letter, chapter 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians. What he's talking about here is the things of God's Spirit, the things about God's Spirit, what God's Spirit has to say. And, and this is how, how it actually plays out in the original Greek text. When it says those who are unspiritual... He actually writes, the psychikos does not accept the things of God's spirit. The psychikos. Wow, what does that mean? Psychic? <laughs> well, that's ultimately where that thing derives from, that term derives from. But psychikoi is a difficult word to translate uh, from Greek into English. It basically means the state of humanity without God's spirit. It's unsanctified human beings. It's, it's human beings in their natural life without the infused spirit of God. As Hayes says, it's people who just don't get it. They just don't get it. And they can't get it. And now we, we live in this sort of new age. The age of eternity has broken into this world. And so people who don't have God's spirit, who haven't been baptized, they're still walking around in their natural life, maybe living the life of a contented animal, but they don't have the Spirit of God. They're not spiritual in that sense. So once you get this, once you receive God's Spirit, you have a different outlook on reality. It's true reality. And this is why he talks about the spiritual person. He says a spiritual person can discern all things, but is himself or herself discerned by no one. So, in other words, you can figure it out if you have the Spirit of God, but really nobody can figure you out. You know what's really going on from God's perspective. We share God's perspective because we have His Spirit. But the world around us can't really understand us. And so he's got a quote here. He closes off his argument with a great quote, and it's from the, uh, this is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 13. Now, here's what this verse is in Hebrew, but he actually quotes it in the Greek. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or has, or as his counselor has instructed him? That's what it says in Hebrew, who has directed the spirit of the Lord. But the way that St. Paul quotes it here is very interesting. Who has known the mind of the Lord, so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That is really cool because basically what Paul is doing, he's quoting from the Greek version of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint, the Greek translation. And the Greek translation switches spirit to mind. Instead of spirit of the Lord, it says the mind of the Lord. And so what Paul is doing, he's he takes that to make his point. He's basically saying, if you have the spirit of God in you, then you have the mind of Jesus Christ in you. This is how we have the mind of Christ. Because spirit and mind are the same thing. So who can tell you what a person's thinking except the spirit of the person that is within them? And you speak, you reveal what's in your spirit. It's the same thing with God. So if you have God's Holy Spirit, you know what's going on in God's mind. Mind and spirit are the same thing for Paul here. They're synonymous. So who has known the mind of the Lord? We do. Because we have the Spirit of Christ. Now, this is quite fascinating because Paul's gone on this huge tangent here, it seems like. He's talking about the cross and its wisdom, what it really means, how God has made the wisdom of the world utter foolishness, moronic. What is this all about? The, but we, we really do have secret wisdom, but it's from the mind of Christ, the Spirit of Christ. But Paul's not being elitist like the Corinthians. Oh, we're so smart. We have this elite spiritual knowledge. We're spiritually mature. We've really arrived in the spiritual life. No. You might think Paul's doing the same thing, but, but here's the key. He brings it all the way back to the cross again. What is the wisdom of the Spirit of God? What is the mind of Christ? You've got to go back to the cross. 
Who is Christ for Paul? He is the one on the cross, the crucified one. So to have the mind of the Lord is to put yourself on the cross. If you're really thinking like Jesus, you have to pattern your life after the cross, a total gift of self in service, in humility, and in love. Because for Paul, the goal is not how much you know, it's how much you love. And everything you know has to be at the service of your love. It helps you to love better because you know Christ better. And he pours out his life in love. So really, if you're really smart, if you're really spiritually wise, Paul says, Corinthians, then you would not be boasting. You would not be fighting with each other. You would not be claiming all these special spiritual privileges for yourself. You have utterly failed the exam here. And this is what he goes into next in chapter 3. He brings it all back. He's gone on this big theological tangent. It seems like a tangent, but he has a point to it. And from now on, he's going to be speaking very clear, very direct language to the Corinthians. Let's check out what he says here. Let's look at the beginning of chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. He says, But I, brethren, could not address you as spiritual men, but as men of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even yet you were not ready, for you were still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving like ordinary men? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely men? So this is straight talk from Paul, and he's brought it straight back to his original point. The disunity in the church. That's the whole theme of the letter. That's what he started off with. I've heard that there are factions among you. I've heard that there are little groups splintering off within you. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. I follow Christ. This is what it's all about. And again, St. Paul's biting sarcasm. They claim to be on the next level spiritually. They claim to be mature, spiritual. Well, no, he says you're actually still of the flesh. And you're not really spiritually mature. You're actually infants. You need to get back to milk. <laughs> the basics of the gospel, not solid food. You're not ready for next level teaching. And by the way, the next level teaching is just being a better <laughs> person like the crucified one. It's getting back on the cross. That's the next level. It's climbing up to the next level on the cross and becoming more of a giving, loving, servant-hearted person. So he's really turned the tables on all these people in the church who thought that they were so spiritual, but they've set themselves apart from others. He puts them back at the bottom. He, he turns the, he turns just as the cross turns the tables on the wisdom of the world, which God makes foolish by the cross. It's not the way we would have done things, but it's the way God did things. St. Paul turns their whole world upside down and says, no, you're not at the top. You're actually still at the bottom. This is a real bucket of cold water on their heads. It's a real slap in the face. This, this is a real call to wake up. How do we reflect on this for our own lives today? I think one of the things that this text causes us to wrestle with in our Catholic lives today is the problem of spiritual pride and elitism. And that can come from many sources. Some, some might take pride in spiritual gifts that they have. Some might take pride in the vocation that God has given them. Some might take pride in their scholarly credentials. I have a PhD. Well, as one of my professors says, PhD stands for phenomenally dumb. No, he's, he was only kidding. He had a PhD as well. But some people can trust in their human credentials with respect to knowledge. Some people glory in the fact that they're living moral lives. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. When we start to look down our noses at people who are not in our little group, then we get into the same problem that the Corinthians had. And it, it tends to be very insular when we get like that. We look at insiders and outsiders, for sure. Now, there is one Catholic faith. We all have to abide by it, of course. But the church exists to evangelize. And the problem with this is that we can fail to look outward sometimes to others who need Christ. If we're not united in our faith, number one, it's a scandal to the world that we're not united. Number two, we tend not to want to evangelize 
because ultimately the devil wants us to be selfish. He wants, he is selfish. He is motivated by selfish pride. That's how he became who he is. So the devil wants to keep us focused on ourselves and our own things. And so what we need to do is look at the cross as St. Paul keeps pointing them back to the cross. This is the real wisdom of God, the real message of God, selflessness. It's love for all, looking outwards. That's what true spirituality is really all about. 